Good afternoon, Northgate, and Merry Christmas. Please hear these words from the Gospel according to Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, would you pray with me? Gracious and glorious God, who came to dwell among us in the form of the Christ child, God, be with us today on this Christmas. Go with us always and help us to show your light and your love to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The day we lost Jesus started off just like any other day. It was late November or early December on a blustery gray day. We had finally finished cleaning the house and we finished putting away all the dishes from Thanksgiving dinner. And my mom had lowered the trap door down from the attic and she had pulled out the rickety old staircase and that could only mean one thing. It was time to decorate the house for Christmas. Every family has their traditions, and one of ours included waiting until after Thanksgiving to put up the Christmas tree and to begin decorating. Some years, we really only waited until the night of Thanksgiving, but you know what? If Thanksgiving dinner was over, and if the dishes had been cleared, it still technically counted, so we went ahead and did it. Some kids spend hours or even days begging their parents to put up the Christmas tree and to decorate for Christmas. I did not have that problem. 
My mom loved Christmas, and she was always excited about it. And by always, I mean that she was excited about it year-round. She was the person who would insist that we make a stop wherever we happened to be every year on our summer vacation to make sure that we bought a Christmas ornament to add to our tree for the year. And that year was no exception. We had gotten the tree out and we had taken out all the decorations out of the attic so the living room had boxes everywhere. I have no idea what my mom was doing but it was probably something that I didn't think was really all that important. She was probably like putting out the Christmas dishes on the dining room table or something like that. I was in middle school at the time and I really wasn't all that focused on dinnerware. Instead, once we hung the lights on the tree, I focused on setting out the Christmas figurines that my mom collected. And so while I was in the process of setting out all of those figurines, I came upon our nativity scene. And so I figured I should put that out too. The characters in our nativity scene were made of ceramic. So each one was individually wrapped up to protect them from breaking while they were in storage. I unpacked each figure and I unwrapped it and placed it in the middle of the coffee table in the living room. It wasn't until I had unwrapped almost all of them that I realized that we were missing one. And of course, we weren't missing any of the magi or farm animals or any of the other characters that you typically see in nativity scenes. No, we were missing Jesus. In our house growing up, this shouldn't have surprised me because lots of things went missing over the years. Our car keys, my homework went missing a few times. Too many socks to count, we lost books. We lost pieces to board games. Basically, if you could name an item, we had probably lost it at one point or another. But losing the savior of the world, that was a first for us. And it didn't really bode well for how Christmas was going to go if we could not find the Christ child. After turning the cardboard box upside down and shaking it and looking all around me, I could not, for the life of me, find this Jesus figurine. So I told my mom, and she really did not seem all that concerned about it. She didn't really think Jesus had gone very far. And she reasoned that he was probably going to turn up eventually. So after unpacking more boxes of wreaths and garland and everything else, I was digging through the bottom of a box of just random decorations when I found a small wrapped item. And once I realized that it was the missing figurine, I held it up and showed my mom and said, I found Jesus. As the words were coming out of my mouth, I remembered how my mom worked for a church and how she would regularly share stories about our family with her coworkers. So I said, well, at least our nativity scene is complete. The story's probably gonna end up in a sermon, isn't it? She didn't even look at me when she responded and said, probably. Now help me out and come straighten out this tree skirt. Merry Christmas, Northgate. It is such a joy to celebrate Christmas Eve with you. We've had a really challenging year in 2021. This has been a year that has been filled with a lot of change. With a global pandemic, damage to our buildings from the winter storm, and reopening our buildings this fall, we've just had a lot going on. I had the enormous privilege of starting here on July 1st, and that brought change too, for all of us. The past six months have been an incredible opportunity for me to get to know you better and to walk alongside you as we deepen our faith and develop as disciples together. 
When I started here this summer, I essentially went on a listening tour. I had conversations with the leadership of the church, and I mostly asked questions because I wanted to hear our stories. One of the best ways that we can get to know people is by listening to the stories they tell us. Our stories tell us who we are. They shape our identity. They form us as a people. The stories we tell say a lot about where we've been, what we value, and about our hopes and dreams for the future. Whether we know it or not, we're all storytellers. We tell stories to each other, and we tell stories to ourselves. One of the greatest gifts I have received, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian, is the power of our story. On the days when it feels like the world is changing so quickly, when I feel overwhelmed, when I am overcome with emotion, both good and bad, there's a story that grounds me. There's a story that gives me hope and that helps me believe. There's a story I tell myself. And that story goes something like this. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. On its own, if we only consider Luke's account of these verses that describe Jesus' birth, it's a fairly ordinary, simple story. Before this story in Luke's gospel, we have angelic appearances and singing and prophecy. But without any fanfare, without any long speeches or musical numbers, in this story, Mary gives birth to her son, wraps him in bands of cloth, and lays him in a manger. In these verses, in this simple story, Mary the mother of Jesus, bore the Son of God into the world. We've come a long way from the first chapter of Luke, where the angel Gabriel was sent by God to Nazareth and told Mary that she would bear a son and would name him Jesus. And Mary responded, saying, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your will, according to your word. I really like Bishop Will Willimon's description of Mary in this story. He said, other than the Trinity, only Pontius Pilate and Mary are mentioned by name in the Apostles' Creed. Pontius Pilate said no to Jesus. Mary said yes. The two poles of human response to God. When a man dressed in white, not a doctor, appears before Mary, Mary responds and says, haven't a clue what's going on here, but nevertheless, I'm willing to be a part of it. Therefore, Mary is known as the very first disciple, the first to consent to be swept up in the purposes of God in Jesus Christ. Because she said yes, Mary makes possible the salvation of the world. Therefore, she's a model for the rest of us. Mary was honored by the church for her docile submission to God's inscrutable will. I praise her as the first to be jolted by the promises of God and say, I don't know where this is headed, but count me in. Where the story headed next was to the shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. In the stillness, in the dark of nighttime, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, 
and the glory of the Lord, the blazing light of God's presence and power shone around them. And they were terrified. That's a reasonable reaction from a group of outcasts who were minding their own business, tending their sheep in the field. And the angel told them a story. The angel said, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And then the angel was joined by a multitude of the heavenly host who praised God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. And then the angels left and went into heaven. And our simple, ordinary story doesn't seem so simple anymore. At that point, the shepherds looked at each other and said, Well, I guess it's time to go to Bethlehem and see what happened so we can see this story that God has made known to us. And they went with haste. They didn't stop. They didn't wait. It doesn't even say that they stopped to check on what the situation was with the sheep. They just got up and left. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and saw that the angel had told them the truth. There was a child lying in a manger. And when they saw that, they told everyone else what they learned about the child. And everyone was amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. In listening to this story, the most incredible story ever told, the story of Jesus' birth, of how God came and dwelt among us, it's amazing to think of how God breaks into the world and surprises us. In 2020 and 2021, these have been times of transition for all of us. Our world is shifting, and change comes in ways that we can't always predict. We don't always know how to respond. Sometimes we're like shepherds sitting in the dark on a hillside, needing to be surprised by the divine, needing to hear about hope. We can make our approach in prayer with the shepherds to the Christ child and what he represents. We can bring our gifts. During times of change and uncertainty, times like the ones we're living in right now, we may not always know what our faithfulness should look like. When everything in our society is bigger and louder and broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week on social media, it's tempting to try to keep up with that because it often feels like the only way we can make an impact is to shout to be heard over everyone else. And there are times when that's appropriate. But to quote Andrew Clark Whaley, there may be a time and there may be a hunger in the world for a community of disciples who quietly go about being faithful. These are the communities who show up with casseroles when a loved one dies. These are the communities where children are raised to know the stories of Jesus, to lead God's people in worship, and to go into the world to look for God's mission. These are communities who show acts of mercy each day without recognition on the nightly news or in the local paper. These are communities where people call each other brother and sister, not because it's a religious title, but because they have become a family of faith who struggle and study and worship and grieve and rejoice together. There is a place for these ordinary communities that quietly birth God's will into the world each day. Communities made up of Marys and Josephs who obediently and without fanfare enact the world-changing will of God. On this 
one of the holiest days of the year, we can focus on our story. There are so many ways we can live out the gospel every day, but one of the most important is to tell our story. As I said before, we're all storytellers. So as long as we're going to tell stories anyway, why not tell the one that's true? The story that guides us and sustains us. Friends, tell our story. And if you feel like you can't get the words just right, the good news is that you don't have to because you can read them off the page. For those of us shepherds sitting in darkness in a field waiting for hope, all of us need to hear the story one more time. There are so many wonderful things about the story in today's reading, but one of my favorites is how many stories are told. The, angels tell, the angel tells the shepherds a story and the shepherds tell everyone else. But before they do, the shepherds tell each other, let us go now to Bethlehem because they know what's theirs to do. I agree with Reverend Sharon Blizzard, who said, our job is to go to Bethlehem right now, right here, in whatever context we live and serve. To do so, however, we first must plumb the depths of our own heart and allow Luke's story to fill us with wonder and hope and awe, just like those first century shepherds. Empire is very much still our context, and human nature has not changed. God continues to break into our world. Jesus is present in bread and wine and in the face of our neighbor. We are stewards of the greatest story ever told, of the light of Christ and of the mystery of the Incarnation. Can we not, on this one night, put all our theological disputes, all our cynicism, and all our fear aside, and fall to our knees in the presence of God reality, God wonder, and God with us? Let us enter tonight to live the Nativity story, to ponder it, to pray it, to be a part of it. Let us go to Bethlehem without an extra helping of nostalgia, without the bells and whistles of a mammoth production, and without any of the preconceived notions and baggage that we all bring to this night. Let us simply be God's people and experience anew the inbreaking of hope and the dawn of salvation. Then, dear friends and stewards of this story, May we be empowered on this most holy night to take the good news of Jesus Christ from the warmth and security of our sanctuary and take it into all the world. Friends, we have so much to be thankful for this year and every year. I'm grateful for you, for the chance we get to worship God together and for the chance we have to tell our story again every single day. I'm grateful for church members who are like family, who faithfully show up all the time and say, I don't know where this is headed, but count me in. I'm so glad you're here. It wouldn't be our story without you. John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, he was known for a lot of things, but he was best known for his preaching. And I think he may have given one of his best sermons through the legend that has it that as he lay dying, he raised his arms into the air and said with all his remaining strength, the best of all is God is with us. If you don't remember the words to tell our story, you could always start there. May the peace of Christ and the wonder of his story Fill our hearts and minds this Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.